I want to welcome the entire Grow family and our Grow family all across the world. Welcome. We pray that you leave today challenged and changed because of the power of the Word of God. From the moment you step in to the moment you leave, it is a house of prayer and praise and preaching. To show them His love, tell them His truth, teach them His ways. Good morning, Grow family. It's great to see y'all this morning. Great to be able to worship our God. Listen, y'all, if you got a testimony, we got to sing it out this morning and praise our God who has saved us. Amen. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in all his wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Yeah, my praise belongs to you forever. my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Oh, yes, He will. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done You're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not dead. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony, oh I'm alive This is my testimony, from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified This is my testimony, this is my testimony This morning to 
to sing in the valley to look toward your goodness my heart set on who you are you're the light that consumes the dark the joy and the strength to lift up my hands and see
shall broken things be healed in their home. You tell fear it has no place, it must go. Oh, we sing it in faith. You tell death it has no chance.
in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. Worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. The way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. What an amazing God we worship. We have committed to 90 days of prayer. We make this house a house of prayer. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, whatever posture is most conducive for you to form your thoughts and prayers and direct them to the Lord. Lord, we have committed for 90 days to pray to you, specifically before we walk into our houses each day. And specifically, O oh Lord, before we come into the house of God. I know some schedules get crazy and our minds slip of this conviction and commitment. But Lord, we will not forget how important it is before we even continue in our worship to pray to you what we have committed over these 90 days. Lord, we begin with confession. As your scriptures say in Psalm 51, verse 10, Lord, for me, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Lord, I pray that for all that have entered this house this morning, all that have joined this house in worship all across the world, Lord, for those that are entering church houses today that honor your name, May we all approach you in our worship with a clean heart and clean hands and a right spirit. For it's that spirit that will give us the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we commit in Psalm 34, verse 1, that we will praise you at all times and everything we speak will be worthy of praise. Every word. I commit that, Lord. As I have all week with my church family, I pray over now these people that their words to their loved ones and their words to each other will edify their homes even when they return there in a few moments. And I pray, Lord, that their words will be praiseworthy as they enter the house of God. For this environment is of worship. How could we bring anything upon our lips that is not worthy of your praise? We commit that to you today and for the remainder of our 90 days. And Lord, we pray a prayer of submission to you. Lord, I submit my will to you. As we have been praying all week, which means I may be wrong and have to change my thinking about what I should be doing or saying or acting. I submit to you. I welcome you. I invite you. I want you to Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting today. Lord, I pray that over our people and everyone watching. Lord, that they would pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts before I walk into my house today. See if there be anything that does not honor you and eradicate it, remove it. Make me walk in the straight path of everlasting life. And Lord, as we now enter the church house, we submit to you in all things. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful time of communion with you. May, Lord, over the next 90 days, this not just be a perfunctory act of routine, but may it become a craving where we long to commune with you, no longer under the request of a church to do it collectively, but because we want to commune with you.
We love you. We could not spend the day without this time with you. Lord, I pray over these precious people that as Peter's last sentence of his last inspired letter, I pray that these people will, quote, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be a strong church, a pure church as a result. May we put to death the deeds of the flesh, and may we be able, with our spirit-controlled hearts, extinguish all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And may this house be a house of prayer and praise and proclaiming of your word. Lord, under the sound of my voice, there are some, I know, who have never accepted you as their Savior. May this be the moment that they take the figurative knee in their heart, maybe even a physical knee, and say, God, forgive me of my sin. I deserve penalty for my sin, but only you can save me. Forgive me of my sin. Only you, were God, come to earth, died on the cross, and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me and save me this day. May this be a house of praise for them this morning. We may never know their names, but only in eternity will you know, and we find out. Lord, guide our minds today on how wonderful it is to crave communion, to crave pure communion, not gathering, not religion, not church, communion. Oh, Lord, how I have been so excited about this portion of your word. I pray that my speech and preaching today be not of enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that our faith would not stand in the wisdom of a man, but in the power of God. Teach us now. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, let's praise him this morning. He is worthy. He is worthy of praise. Last week, we shared an analogy that we've been sharing with our men of the church, and that is we all need a place to go to commune with the Lord. And we've made a commitment to commune and actually have a time where before we go into our homes, we will get our hearts right with God. And so some men have a shed, and some women have a garden, and some people have a garage. I, this week, I got pictures of people's literal garages and areas, and it's been great. Got a lot of texts from people that say, uh, I don't have a shed, but I have my car before I go into work, and it's been wonderful to see you really take to heart that for the next 90 days, we will prepare our hearts before we walk into our houses and prepare our hearts before we walk into the house of God. So if you've joined us, that's the thought process we're in in this collection of messages. If you have your Bibles, open to uh, Psalm 63. If you have your phones, pull up Psalm 63, because this psalm is, is a great second step to our message. Last week, we talked about how uh, when the Lord calls, our hearts should run and say, I I'm coming, Lord, I'm coming. And we talked about how people's conduct was noticeably different when they were alone with Jesus. Hannah, after she prayed, her heart was lifted in 1 Samuel 1. In Acts uh, chapter 4, they recognized that these men had been with Jesus. In Acts 16, they sang praises in the prison cell, and they'd noticed that they had time with Jesus. So when you spend time with Jesus, your, your heart, your attitude is noticeably different. We are very, very encouraged about the families and the couples of the church definitely doing this so that their home life is different. And we said, if you do this, your home will never be the same again. Tammy and I were talking. We're, we're very excited about planning some kind of um, uh, couples kind of, kind of evening services to kind of do throughout the year, kind of just gather at couples of all ages uh, to talk about just how can we strengthen our relationships, all types of relationships. doesn't even have to be couples, but within the body of Christ, and we're really really intentional about that, and we're also talking intentionally about uh, getting with the men, of course, and the women, and, and cultivating those relationships independent of each other, and then bringing the couples together. I'm really excited about what the Lord is doing. 
So we've talked about how the importance of that was last week and how things can be different. Um, So I want to take you to a portion of Scripture that actually describes the final product, what it looks like after the end of these 90 days in my prayer is that you get to this point, this psalm, these three verses, well before the 90 days. The reason why it's 90 days is because there is, some people do this already, and this is just a continuation of their prayer time, but some people need to kind of be kind of jerked into it. They, 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 they've given themselves over to not having this spiritual practice, and when they know that other believers are coming around for this positive encouragement that the entire church is doing this, we're finding that couples are actually creating a pattern of praying independent before they get into their homes. And so we want to do this throughout the summer, all the way to July 16, and I hope it just continues, even though we'll stop the initiative. So we said that last week, it makes a difference, it'll change your home. Now I want you to see the final product. How do you know if your intentional prayer time took? We're going to look at uh, a man in a very challenging circumstance, and his communion with God is what got him through. But what got him through, he's in a very, very tough challenge right now, but what got him through was very interesting. It was his, his personal, quiet communion with God that prepared him to be so strong in the cataclysmic moments of his life. Let me say that again. It was his personal, sweet, calm, tranquil communion with God when life was fine that got him through challenging times. We're praying for the 90 days because I have no doubt that all of us in life will go through a challenge. You will have a challenge to quit on God, some of you. You will have a challenge to quit on many things. You will have a a challenge to entertain sin. You will have a challenge to argue with your spouse. You have a challenge to let the stresses of life get to you. And I want to show you a man that is in, it's actually the second time it's happened to him, the the equal top number one challenge of his life. And you're going to hear a man that admits It's hard, but what's getting him through? And what got him through is what gets you and me through. My hope is that as we pray while it's tranquil and calm, that our spiritual strength would build so much that we will have a default reaction that when challenges come, we default to communing with God, trusting him, and you trust him no matter what. And you have spiritual thinking. You don't even entertain sin. In fact, folks that want to serve sin up to you, it's foreign. You don't even want it in your company. In fact, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, there's an interesting Greek word that occurs. It says, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and judgment. And then there's only one word in the Greek language at that time. It's not the normal word for judgment. He says, the more you commune with God, you will have discernment. Now, it's the Greek word esthesia, where we get our word aesthetics. When you're really, really, really spiritually controlled, the Lord gives you a level of discernment that is beyond judging right or wrong or better or best. He gives you esthesia, aesthetics is like what things look like. He gives you the ability just to look at something and know it's wrong. Gives you that premonition like that person isn't speaking truth. Why would someone walking in the light try to destroy the church? What what is going? And and you begin to get that estate, and you realize, you know what? I have been communing with God, and sin. I'm so sensitive to the baby step sin. I remember when Emma had, um, when she was a little baby, she was. uh, It it, it was a crazy, crazy scene. I, I, I regret to even share this, but. Uh, we had this little kitchen island, and I put her on the island, and, and I was teaching her about fire. And um, parents, you know, it, it was this multicolored candle, and it looked really pretty, and I knew that she um, was going to be attracted to it because it was very colorful. She was really little, so as the candle sat there, you know, you go through these exercises. You go, I go, Emma, see that? I go, oh, no, no, hot, 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 burn baby, burn baby. And then I bring her hand closer. I go, hot, 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 no, 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 touch, burn baby, burn baby. And we did that exercise so that she would know, you know, you just pull away. Couldn't, couldn't believe that I left 
the room, got a laundry basket, and I never forget Emma screaming at the top of her lungs, hot, hot, burn baby, hot, hot. And I'll never, I, my heart, you know, parents, you just, just this chill, you drop it, you run in. And I looked, but it was not the scene I had expected. Chairs were not overturned. The candle wasn't lit. She wasn't burning her hand. Her hand is about two feet away, and she's going, hot, hot, burn baby, hot. And I grab her hand. I'm like, what's, what's going on? And I realized she had no calluses on her hands. It was so tender. She could feel the small heat from that candle two feet away. I think, oh, my goodness, I play in the wax. I can put my finger in the fire. She was so sensitive, she could feel the string of something. So, and that is the goal of praying, that you are so keenly sensitive to sin that the more you pray and confess and everything is praiseworthy and that you submit yourself to the Lord, as soon as sin comes in your midst, you're like, no, 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 that's wrong. And then when you get into the challenging times, when you are weak on all emotional fronts and the evil one goes, half God said, oh, familiar phrase there, Eve, Adam, half God said, because this really doesn't satisfy, this little get on your knees thing when you're wondering about your job or your family or your child and everything's breaking down, this doesn't feel too satisfying, does it have God's, and he makes you question God. And right there, if you are already prayed up in the quiet moments of your life, you will immediately say, no, get thee behind me, Satan. You will have that esthesia, that moral perception, one scripture translates, Philippians 1, 9, the ability to just go, I will not let sin in my presence, and I will not distrust the Holy One of God because I have seen him all my life. And the way you get strong in your challenges is that in the tranquil moments of your life, you layer on that strength, the house that builds its house upon a rock. You, length, you layer it and layer it and strengthen and strengthen and strengthen. You're going to see a man who ends his story by saying the phrase, I, God, will praise you. But in two verses before that, he says how dry he is inside. Why? He layered it on his trust, his prayers. That's why we're praying for 90 days. Are we praying 90 days to prepare you for a challenge? Yes. What is that? I don't know. You might already be receiving a challenge right now. But the goal is to pray so that we are spiritually sensitive to sin so that we do not ever distrust the holy God. As the song says, even when we don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. Never stops working. So David is in, I would say, the worst scenario, even though I said he's been in this scenario before. He has fled from King Saul and worried about his life. But this time he's running for his life because his own blood is trying to kill him, his son. In 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 19, you get the story of Absalom trying to kill David. So you've got to go back a little. In 1 Chronicles chapter 3, it lists all of David's family, huge family, sons. Absalom is David's third oldest son. Um, Amnon is the first. You'll hear that name here. Daniel, not Daniel we think of, but just Daniel, common name, was the second. Then Absalom was the third son, and then you, you find a large family. What happened was there was a daughter named Tamar, and uh, David is king at this time, and he is um, Amnon, the oldest son, violated Tamar and, and violated her and disrespected her, and Absalom took her, the, his sister in Tamar to protect her, but Absalom's anger was so enraged that he um, said, I'm going to kill Amnon, and of course, David was like, even, even the... By the way, David's probably saying, I understand that emotion. I killed Bathsheba's husband. I, I get it. But you can't. You can't follow my footsteps. It's very interesting how someone's past sins doesn't make you do anything, but it sure does put the proclivity in you. You have to overcome it. But David saw this before. He says, you can't. You can't kill Amnon. We'll deal with him. Absalom refused. And Absalom began and killed him, and despised David for that because when he killed him, David says, you, I cannot see your face for two years. You have to move away, and then you can come back to Jerusalem, but for two more years, we, 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 can't, we can't have this. So Absalom built up guilt like he, was, um, he had justice in his own hands, so why, Dad, aren't you going to let me? So then Absalom went against, plotted, got a bunch of men, 
and plotted against David. David was caught unaware, and he immediately, with some of his loyal teammates, left and wandered. He, um, the Lord was very uh, sovereign in this because there were some advisors that advised David, and David said, you advisors, go advise them and ruin and thwart their plans. Give him bad advice so that he can't commit his sinful deeds. And, and that's how the Lord works. It's Sin is always blind. Uh, whenever someone tries to attack, say, in this case, the man of God or, or those that were living righteously, sin always trips up. They're, they're, they're blind to, to their actions. And so the loyal advisors were telling him not to attack, and he didn't. And as a result, David was able to overcome him. And in a battle, Absalom had long hair, it was caught in a tree, and uh, then uh, Joab, David's general, was able to, uh, to uh, slay, slay Absalom, and, and it just even burdened David's heart. It was just crazy. But this is the psalm where he is running, and he is alone. And you're going to hear how he is grieving, because his boy is there, and he can't be in the city that he wants to be in. So listen to words about being parched and dry, and then watch the two things he longs for and says, watches, and believes that if he has these two things, he can have a renewed, watch this, a renewed worship experience in this challenge and wilderness without getting his throne back. And without getting his comfort back and without getting back in the sanctuary, he can, he has deduced what it takes to be full of worship in this challenge. And it has nothing to do with methods, it has nothing to do with location, it has nothing to do with his throne or his comfort. He realized what it takes it takes communing with you, not people. I love people, but you. And then he reflects back on something he used to do while he was with people that motivated him and stimulated his worship while he was alone. This is a phenomenal psalm that is so applicable to you and me. When we're in the challenge, remember that you can end the story by saying, I will praise you because I'll run to you And I'll remember how good it was to worship you with others. So look at verse 1. He's hurting. He is running. Oh, God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts after you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. This concept of thirst is so relevant to the Middle East. If you've been there, and I I hope to go there. I've been talking uh, to uh, uh, a couple of our members regarding um, starting to look at missions trips on and getting exposed. And what we're looking at is looking at the demographics of Richmond and say, who is in our community? And there's a lot of folks from the Middle East, and we thought, well, rather than just say, hey, let's go willy-nilly anywhere, why don't we go to places that we can come back home and tell our neighbors, hey, I just went to your hometown, or I'm going to your home country. Can you tell me how to react? What should I expect? And to create a relationship with people here so that we experience there and here. And we're looking at the Middle East. We're looking at Jordan, of course, Israel, and other places. I cannot wait to expose us, but rather than just going anywhere, we're looking at who the Lord has local so that then we can go global. But if you go to the Middle East, you will find that they'll say, it does not feel hot, but carry at least two bottles of water. It's very dry, very parched. Uh, If you've ever been there, it's, 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 you, you, your body doesn't um, think it is, but it's very, very dry. And we all understand this concept of thirst. When you're dehydrated, um, causes headaches. Uh, you're uncomfortable. You cramp. You can't function accordingly. Blurred vision, definitely. It's funny. My daddy, you know, I don't know if you do things that your parents have done for decades, but I don't know why. This is not a learned trait, but for some reason, my daddy used to always uh, drink water with extra, extra ice in it. 
just always. And some of you that, that we eat together, and I'm like, hey, can you grab me a water? You always will grab water packed with ice, and then you'll grab me an extra cup of ice. I don't know why. He just always did that. Every sip had to be super cold. How many of you, by the way, drink, like, room temperature water? How do you do that? How many of you do that with lemon? Oh, goodness. Um, both of those, I just, I just can't do it. But I just love ice cold water. In fact, whenever I go to a restaurant, uh, Mexican food, I try my phrase, agua con mucho hielo, water with extra ice. And they think I'm good. And then they keep on talking to me in Spanish, and I'm like, that's all I got. Um, one time I thought I would spruce it up a little bit. I, I, I wanted to say, may I please have water with extra ice, agua con mucho hielo. And instead, I said, I don't know why, the server looked at me, I said, me llamo agua con mucho hielo. And if you know me llamo, it means my name is. My name is water with extra ice. <laughs> and my, my wife just looks at me, he goes, he'll have a water. You know, after almost 26 years, yeah, he'll just have water. Um, for some reason, you, you understand thirst. I am on a Diet Coke kick. I don't know why, but, but it's, it's funny. When I go to the fridge, I think I want Diet Coke, but my body tells me you really want water, and I'm always kind of wanting it. There, there's something about that water. You understand that thirst, that craving. You cannot function, and that's a very normal thing. And there, that's a real thing. So you know that a king is wandering. But notice what? One, two, three, four times. Look at what he's wanting. Oh, God, you, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. The word shacher is the word earnestly search for. Some translations say early. Some say seek. Some say search earnestly. Um, it's the term that means um, when light comes on, you're able to look. So some translations take that first part of that translation, meaning when the light comes on, meaning like when the sun rises, so they will translate it early. But really, it's like, hey, I can't see. Turn on the light. As soon as you turn on the light, I can start looking. It's conducive now. And that's kind of the meaning. So that's why it says earnestly search. I, I, I can now seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Now notice this. My whole body longs for you. My whole body. This is the word kamak in Hebrew. It it means that it's actually fainting. My whole spirit is affected. Now, when you get in challenges, I have this, I have this when I pray for people. I was just in the hospital late, late, late chat, and I actually, very late, in Chippenham, and praying for Ken and Lucille and Barney just for, for peace during this time. It's, there, she's ready. And I always pray, Lord, to us, this is a prayer request. But to them, O oh Lord, it's consuming their lives. You can't get away from family struggles. You share it with loved ones, and as much as we want to empathize, we, we just aren't in your shoes. Now, some of us have walked the same type of path, but you're in it. And you know when it says, I'm thirsty, I need you, but then this phrase, you, get, you understand where David is. My whole body feels faint, and I can't think, and that's when we are all consumed, and we have to seek the Lord before we walk into our house because it's when I lay my head on the pillow, and it's when I go in the cubicle at night and, or at work, and then when I, when I walk the street, and when I'm in the morning, when I'm driving to school, it just never leaves us these challenges. And he says it's all consuming, but notice this, he, he has enough wherewithal spiritually to say what I need is not the comfort of my throne, not my throne room, not the benefits, not the servants. Oh God, you are my God. I search you. My soul thirsts for you. I need and long for you in this land that doesn't provide nourishment. It was said this week, and I love the phrase, it's unfortunate, it says that my heart is burdened over those that attend church out of perfunctory or, can, or uh, tradition rather than the burden of needing the Lord. So you have to ask yourself, he knew he needed God. He knew nothing but God. In his circumstances, when no one's around, he just needed God. God. If you've been there or are there, you know exactly what David's saying. 
I need you. So then the Lord starts infusing his heart with memories. By the way, let me just read you uh, a few psalms I love. Psalm 42. Psalm 42, talking about the uh, needing the Lord. Psalm 42, verse 1, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long after you. I thirst for God. I thirst for the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Isaiah 44, verse 3, I will pour out water, the Lord says, to quench your thirst. I will irrigate your parched fields. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and blessings upon your children. They will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a willow bank. Psalm 143, verse 1, hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my plea, answer me because you are faithful and righteous. Verse 3 of Psalm 143, my enemy chased me down, he has knocked me to the ground, the forces, he forces me to live in darkness like those in the grave. I'm losing hope, I'm paralyzed with fear. I remember the days of old, though, I ponder your great works and think about what you have done for me. I lift my hands to you in this situation, I thirst for you. As parched land thirsts for rain. Isaiah 55, verse 1, Jesus says, okay, is, or the Lord says, okay, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, it's free. Come and take your choice of wine or milk, it's free. This is an Old Testament picture of salvation. When, why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat good and you will eat and drink of the finest food. No surprise then, Jesus in John chapter 4 says, anyone who drinks of this water will soon be thirsty again, but those that drink of the water that I give will never be thirsty again because it comes fresh of a spring of living water within them, giving eternal life. John chapter 7, verse 37, no surprise, Jesus says, anyone that thirsts, come to me. Whoever believes in me, come and drink, for the scriptures say, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Quote from Isaiah 55. And in his first recorded sermon, Matthew chapter 5, he says, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for me, and you will be satisfied. David knew that. And then the Lord starts infusing him with a memory that stimulates and satisfies his spiritual growth in the challenge. How does David begin to crave his communion with God, he remembers how it was back home to have regular worship with other believers. Let that one sink in. You know why we pray and fast over what is happening within the 11 o'clock hour and why we make sure this is nothing but prayer, praise, preaching, because people need this. You come, I see it in your eyes every week. You come and you need this. His regular worship corporately reminds him that it is good and I can have that experience when I'm in my challenge I remember how good it is and how strong I was to hear the praises as we gazed upon the glory of God. So now in my challenge, I'm going to reflect back and say, I can have that praise time right now, even though I'm alone. Why? Because I have you. Because you know what this corporate worship experience is, even though we're collectively together, it's you worshiping the Lord. You individually, as we sit by each other, worshiping the Lord, there's an audience of one, and he says, it was so wonderful to do that. That is stimulating me and motivating me to worship him just like that when I'm all alone, and now his heart starts getting lifted. Watch this. This is beautiful, beautiful verse, verse 2. I have seen you, past tense, I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power in your glory. Now, you must know that only priests are allowed in the private, one-on-one individual place of the sanctuary. Even the king did not have access to the private holy place. Regardless of his title, he was, and yes, a lot of security around him, he was called to be corporately worshiping with other people. Of course, they had security measures and everything. But he says, I have seen you 
in your sanctuary. I've gazed upon your power and glory. Now listen, never in this psalm is he saying, so can you get me back there, please? I want to be back in my comfy worship experience. I want to get back to Jerusalem. He never wants his throne back. What he wants in his challenge is God and his presence. He knows that comfort, watch, comfort doesn't make him strong. It's communion. He doesn't want the perfunctory acts of liturgy. He wants communion. He doesn't want he doesn't want his worship experience to be a convenient addition. He wants it to be an all-consuming addiction. What he wants is, don't, I don't need my comfort. I don't need my previous things. I love how we did, church. Don't need the methods back. What I want for you right now today, God, is to be present and to give me that worship again so I gaze on you, and that's going to get me through. He just wants to worship in the challenge. And when you pray and you confess and you praise and you submit to him, the Lord does something amazing that you're like, family, I don't know what's happening, but we can still praise. We can still have a worship experience. It's okay in this challenge. Dad, how can you be so strong? Mom, how can you be so strong in the middle of the challenge, how, you, how can you say God's here and we can still have rich communion times with him and we can gaze on his power? How do you get to that point? Because in the tranquil, quiet days of your life, when nothing was wrong, you worshiped him in spirit and in truth. You layered on the communion for when the challenges came, you're like, we had great experiences. Our circumstances change, but it's not the circumstance that has to change my communion and worship with him. It can still happen. What spiritual maturity? Listen to this verse, Psalm 27, verse 4. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, de delighting in the Lord's perfection and meditating in his temple. Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, place, O Lord of heaven armies. Yes, I long, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the birds find homes and build their nests close and their young close to your altar. O Lord, I long to be close, my King and my God, for joy. For what joy for those who can live in your house and always be singing your praises. And all of a sudden, David realizes those psalms that he wrote, he just realizes, I can have that right in my challenge. The goal for praying for 90 days is you to be and I to be so spiritually strong that when challenges come, it does not fracture our communion with God. It does not desensitize us to sin. Even in challenges, we've gotten alone with God and our awareness of his glory as we gaze upon him is still alive and well. Some of you will need 90 days to cultivate this spiritual discipline. Some of you are there and will use this 90 days to further solidify it. The promise is that each one of us, no matter how strong or how much we're developing our spiritual strength, we will experience challenges, and that will be the moment you get your report card on how strong you are. I pray you will strengthen yourself in your spiritual walk over these 90 days. Now watch the conclusion. It does not sound like verse 1. does not sound like verse 2. Verse 3, your unfailing love is better than living. His own son is out to kill him. Not Saul, his own blood. You can understand the prodigal son story here. Your unfailing love. We just sang about that. When you're in your challenge, what gets you through is, God, you've never left me. You were there in the tough times of my life, and I remember in the corporate worship times of my life when I loved hearing the praises. And now I remember that in that sanctuary, 
I sang about how great is thy faithfulness. Now I need to apply it. I've seen you've been faithful in bedsides when the doctor's like, it's just a little bit longer. Leaders have seen it in the scriptures when it says, when individuals do not give you the benefit of the doubt or they don't assume the best and they believe rumors and lies, God speaks straight to the leader who is very lonely and says, we're just two or three years gathered and you know the truth. No, I am with you. When you're struggling with your family and you have a wayward loved one and your heart is always grieved, you remember your unfailing love. You're always there. You're always there. My parents have a phrase with each other. They've been married over 50 years. And they have this phrase to each other. Honey, it's you and me against the world. Because there's only... One, two, maybe, people, single digits of people that truly display to you unfailing love. It's those commitments that you find that are what carry you through. You know what the beauty of the Lord's love is? His love exceeds the time of your life. Goes farther than just when you die. Whenever I perform a wedding, I say, this couple in a moment will share vows till death do us part, but not so with the Lord God. For the scriptures say, Romans chapter 8, verse 38, 39, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, or things present, or things to come, the height, nor death, or any other creature will be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And sometimes when you're in your challenges, and you don't know how you're getting out, One thing that he brings to remembrance is that, yes, remember the truths that you sang with other believers together and know that I'm with you. But one thing I want you to know when when you think about me being with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That unfailing love is so rare that if you have it in a spouse, you never want to let it go. And when you have it in the Lord, you cling on to that relationship. How could I ever go against a faithful God who loved me despite of all my blasphemous mistakes against him? And God showed us mercy so much. And you realize, God, I'm dry inside and But I remember how good those truths were when things were calm. So now I bring all those praises to remembrance when I gazed upon your power and glory. And I know I got you, so Lord, I will remember you are the way maker, the miracle worker. That is who you are. Your love is unfailing. You never sleep nor slumber, we'll talk about next week. You will never be unaware of my circumstances. You will never be sluggish to respond. You know exactly my heart condition right now. You know my prayers, you know my challenges, but you will never leave me alone even though the whole world is turning against me. You will never despise your your own. You will never leave me orphaned. You, God, you, I long for you. Because nobody has offered that to me. No one. Psalm 27, verse 8. Our hope is that you see this relationship so profoundly that you love communing with him and you love communing. You, you just know it's what gets you through that your heart at the end of these 90 days reacts just like this verse. Psalm 27, verse 8. My heart has heard you say, come talk with me. And my heart immediately responds, yes, I'm coming. Yes, I'm coming. Oh, because I need it so deeply. I need the communion so profoundly. When you call God, I'm running. I'm dropping everything. Why? Because that is so, so needed. If you're like me, I can be in any location, in any meeting, but when my children call me, I say, I'm sorry, I've got to get this. 
Now my girls do it to me. We'll be having dinner with the family and their boyfriends will call. <laughs> oh, oh, it's him. I got to take this. I'm like, okay, I got, got, oh, okay. I know where I stand. That's good. Because it's, it's a call of unfailing love. When your family calls you, it's a call of unfailing. You're going to take that call. Why? Because there are very few that have committed their life to you. And over these 90 days, the Lord is doing this call to us. Come talk with me. And we're like, oh, I've got to take that call. I've got to get out to the shed. I've got to get out to my quiet place because God is calling me. And whenever I meet with that God, he just guides me and gives me thinking and protects me. I love that call because whenever I answer that call, I gaze upon his power and glory. And I'm reminded of his unfailing love. And he purifies my mind. And he keeps me so sensitive to sin. And he guides me. And I'm a better dad for it. I'm a brother, brother and son and mom and, and daughter and friend. I am a better person for his glory. I must take that call. And our hope is over the next 90 days, you take that call and you want to take that call. You need to take that call. You want to commune with the Lord. You want to see his glory. You want to commune with him and you just say, I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. I'll sing hallelujah till the end of my day, but I just want to be with you. That is the goal over the next 90 days, to just want to be with the Lord. Let me read for you all the verses that lead up to this key verse. Here are the verses that lead up to that verse. Watch this. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Delighting in the Lord's perfections, meditating on him. He will conceal me when there are troubles that come. He will hide me in his shade and I will, he will place me out of reach in a high rock. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. In his presence, I will offer sacrifices and shouts of joy, singing praises, praising to the Lord with music. And the Lord says, yes, that's true. Hear me. Be merciful to me. My heart heard you say, come. Talk to me. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming. Because I want you. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? King of glory, fill this place. I just want. just want to be with you. King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. We'll bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. So let's start right now. Why, Why would we, we wait? wait? We can praise we you can now. We praise you now. In victory. King of glory. King of glory. Fill this place. I just want to be with you. 
your presence until you come again. So I'll sing hallelujah until you come again. And I'll dance in your presence until you come again. We will sing hallelujah. I pray that this huddle and this gathering will stimulate worship throughout the week, knowing that this is not the only time you worship. This is a motivation. This is the huddle. Now, we go out into the field and we execute. This is the mile marker on the marathon. I hope you were excited to, as the psalmist said, to gaze upon his power and glory. Now, go out and have this type of worship experience this week even in your challenge. And I pray seven days from now, you are stronger and sensitive and strong in in your communion with the Lord. That is my prayer. On behalf of the Grove family, I just want to thank many of you that have come. If you're here as our guest, we love having guests in our home. We have a lot of them every Sunday. Uh, We all chipped in and we have a gift for you. So if if this is your first time, please go to the Welcome Center. Tell them Pastor Ben sent you. Actually, actually, tell them the whole church sent you. And uh, you just pick a name and send them out there and uh, get that guest. But if you would, as soon as you get that gift, do a U-turn. Come right back. We hang out, and I'd love to meet you. And met wonderful families last week. And just really, except one, one couple came with tears in their eyes, and they said, I have longed for a church that is real, just like me, and I feel like I can worship so freely. I just, I just, he, he just, the Shrek family, I just am so grateful just that, that made me so proud. They're like, this is like a big family. I'm like, ah, you caught on. That's what we are. Um, just want to share a couple little things real quick. Um, give you a couple things. We're excited. We are uh, looking forward to the best week ever. I was in the turn lane up here uh, for our kids. I was in the turn lane, and this guy's in a convertible in front of me, and he's looking at that banner, and he gets his phone out and starts digging up the website. I'm like, wow, this is really working. So Lord only knows who's going to come, but this is for our kids on June 18th through 21. If you want to get a front row seat to miracles, join us. We are all rolling up our sleeves and we are serving these children and you are going to see life change happen. I encourage you, go onto our website, the QR code anywhere. We have a special BWE Best Week Ever uh, uh, page on our website. Uh, just explore opportunities. Just go there and say, give me more information. I'd like to serve. Um, We have really done it in an efficient way, and our kids are going to have the best experience ever. 
getting to know other Christian kids, learning about the scriptures, and life change, and many new souls, we pray we will be with in glory. Love those kids. Oh, my goodness, love those kids. Uh, want to encourage you. If we say, put, why don't you put the best in the best week ever? And uh, join us. It's going to be crazy. Got to have some energy, though, by the way. And you can sit down if people are screaming too much, and uh, you can do that. Uh, number two, um, let me uh, encourage you. The women throughout the summer are uh, popping up, and uh, because we start our Bible studies in the fall, the women have their first pop-up, and it's called the Happy Little Trees pop-up. Now, this started with this guy right here, brother. Do you want to explain what they're doing? The- it's a... It's a- it's a little Bob Ross day. They're going to be in 105, and they're just going to follow along to Bob Ross and do their own little paintings. Nobody's going to come close to Bob Ross, but uh, I, I did this in college with some friends, which is really funny. Just a bunch of dudes in an apartment doing some Bob Ross painting. And uh, when COVID hit and I couldn't be with all the kids, I made a YouTube video of me painting, and they I'm sure y'all just watched. Some of them actually did it. But I'm sure they just watched and laughed at me for like 45 minutes as I did whatever it was to that canvas, yeah. Painted happy trees. Yeah, ah, lots of happy accidents. Happy little accidents all over that thing. It was great. <laughs> happy little. And so the ladies are getting in the room. They're getting their palace or paintbrushes, and you guys are going to be painting one of Bob Ross's things. That's going to be hilarious. That's on a Friday. Um, be sure to register on the garden webpage. The men, one day before that, we're going golfing. We are going to the drive shack. Just don't stand to the right. I slice pretty bad. That's all I'm saying. Unless I can hold a seven iron. Seven iron, I can hit straight, but it's 100 yards. That's all I got. So, but um, at the drive shack, we got them. We, we, Michelle and her four children, she really connected us. And I'm not ashamed to say thank you to organizations that help us out. Thank you so much. She got the full buffet for us if you come, guys. The bay's two hours at a prime time night. That's a, that's a Thursday night. And uh, they really believed in, in what we're doing here at Grove. So thank you, Michelle, and the team there. And so sign up. Um, there is a limited number, so you're going to have to sign up on the Shed webpage there at, um, on our website as well. Uh, let me remind you, uh, 90 Days of Prayer, we've talked about this as well. Just pray, and may this be a, a cultivating a habit, and I hope that you are uh, strengthened by it. I really, really do. Um, Lastly, I'm going to slip this in because she is, remember I talked about unfailing love and it's rare you have the Lord, but it's, you know, usually in our lives we only have one. Well, I have one person that I have her unfailing love and it's her birthday this week on Wednesday. So happy birthday to the love of my life. So she's 29. 29. I said, we probably should have done the Fall Family Bash fundraiser with her age because two nine. You could get in increments of nine or two or 92 or nine, 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 two. So either way, so happy 29th birthday, and it's great. So Grove family, I love you, and I look forward to seeing you every single week. I hope you have a wonderful week in the Lord. God bless you. Rejoice in the Lord this week. We'll see you next week.